Hi, Martin. Hi, Anand. Great to see you today. Same here. So today my guest is Martin Savelsberg. He's a logistic and optimization specialist with over 30 years of experience in mathematical modeling, OR, optimization methods, algorithm design, performance analysis, transport, supply chain management, and production planning. He has published over 200 research papers in many of the top OR and optimization journals and has supervised more than 30 PhD students. Martin has a track record of creating innovative techniques for solving large-scale optimization problems in a variety of areas, including service network design, last mile and crowdsource delivery, and ride sharing. He has demonstrated an ability to design and implement highly sophisticated and effective optimization algorithms, as well as an ability to analyze practical decision problems and translate the insights obtained into optimal business solutions. Martin is an INFORMS Fellow and he was the James C. Adamfield Chair in the H. Milton Stewart School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech until he retired in 2021. He is past Editor-in-Chief of Transportation Science, one of the most prestigious academic journals in the area of transportation science and logistics. Martin, it's a huge pleasure to have you here. You are one of the giants of our field, uh, so thank you so much uh, for accepting the invitation. My pleasure. So I know you're in Australia right now, and I'm aware that you worked many years at Georgia Tech, but where are you actually from? I was born and raised in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and I spent the first 30 years of my life there uh, before starting to travel around the world. Okay, um, I have recently visited Amsterdam for the second time, and it's such a great city. Uh, I was uh, in a hotel uh, near the museums, the Van Gogh's and uh, Hex Museum, so uh, it was uh, very, very nice to, to be there again. Um, can you speak a bit uh, about your parents? Sure. Um, I have two, a father and a mother. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, both are sort of no longer with me. Uh, they passed away. Um, they met uh, at, at the bank where they were both working at the time. After I was born, my mother became a, a stay-at-home mom to take care of me, and my father continued his career at, at the bank. Right. Uh, how old are you now, if I may ask? Uh, you may ask. Uh, I am 63. Okay, so so I assume your parents were children of the war, and if so, did that have any impact in your own childhood? Uh, they were children of the world war, um, so between the ages of five and ten, uh, which I'm sure has impacted them. Uh, in, 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 in ways that I can't even sort of uh, grasp. And um, so the, the most obvious thing I remember was um, it, it was impossible to leave anything on your plate at dinner. It's clear that they had gone through very desperate times where food was very scarce. Um, my mother was telling me stories about her father having to cycle 40 to 50 kilometers just to get uh, uh, some food for the children um, in, in the worst periods of the war. Um, I, I think the other thing, and, and I've come to realize that probably only later in life, is that in certain ways they were very guarded. I think during the period of the war, they had to be very careful in uh, sort of what they say, what they don't say, what they emotions they display, um, just for security and safety purposes. And I think some of that was still there uh, while I was growing up. Um, even though at the time I may not have noticed that, but looking back, I think they were guarded uh, maybe more than people that have not gone through such experiences. Right. Um, do you have siblings? No, I'm an only child. Okay. Uh, 
you grew up in the Netherlands, as you said, during the 60s and 70s. And I have to ask uh, if you were an enthusiastic about soccer, especially because of the famous uh, clockwork orange. Um, I, I, every Dutch boy uh, pretty much has to play soccer at least for a period of his life. Uh, I did that. I started playing soccer probably when I was around seven or eight. Um, and, and enjoyed doing that for a number of years until I switched to basketball when I was 14. Um, and soccer is important. Um, this is a bad time to bring it up because the Dutch have just um, lost in, in the World Cup in Qatar. So it's a bit disappointing. Um, in a certain way, the glory years or some of the glory years of the Dutch national team were exactly in, in sort of my teenage years in the 70s. Um, they made it to the final of the World Cup twice in 74 and 78. Unfortunately, they also lost twice, um, which for me was pretty devastating, especially in 74. Um, I, I can still remember uh, much of that game vividly um, and, and every probably soccer fan around the world can remember some of that game where the Dutch were leading after 90 seconds without Germany ever touching the ball and still in the end uh, the Dutch lost but so that was uh, a very troubling uh, period in my life. <laughs> Um, I, I remember I was keeping a journal, clipping newspaper articles, writing things myself about all the games. Um, I, I, I might still have it somewhere, uh, but I know the one thing that happened is I didn't finish it. Uh, I was too devastated to talk about the final. Um, so, yes, yeah, soccer has been a big part of my life. It was very difficult after I moved to the U.S., Uh, in 93 to keep up with soccer. Um, internet was not yet what it is now and, and media online. So after that, I lost track a little bit and really only pay attention to soccer during World Cups. Right. Yeah, when I asked you, I expected something uh, in the lines that you just answered, but I did not expect that you were really, really a fanboy up to the point of keeping track in a journal. That's very interesting to learn. <laughs> yes, it. I, I guess, I, I mean, you come from a, a, a soccer playing nation yeah. as well with a lot of soccer history. Um, in, in the time of the World Cup, the country becomes completely orange. People are out on the street and, and all people can talk about is soccer. Um, and, and so I do remember Uh, especially because the team um, at the time with Joachim, which is one of the soccer greats, um, was tipped at least to be one of the teams that would have a good chance. And so, yes, I kept kept a journal from from the first game to uh, last minus one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that team is very popular even in Brazil. Uh, the The senior journalists, let's put it like that, they love to talk about that, about Cruyff, you know. So I, I'm really aware of the, the, the achievements. And it's a pity that, uh, that they did not win in, in either 74 or 78. Uh, so uh, you mentioned basketball. Uh, how far uh, have you made as a basketball player? So as I mentioned, I switched to playing basketball around 14 um, and that became a true passion for me. I, pretty much every single day I would go out mostly by myself to just shoot hoops, as they say. Um, now, I'm um, six, six feet, 183. Uh, so I'm not a very tall player, especially, I mean, for Dutch people that tend <laughs> to be quite tall, certainly now. 
Um, so I played uh, 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 number two guard, mm -hmm. uh, shooting, shooting guard. guard. Yeah. Um, and I, I did make it reasonably far, which is a lot easier in the Netherlands because basketball, certainly at the time, was not the most popular game. But I made it to the Dutch national junior team, so between mm. 16 and 18, um, for, for a very short period. Uh, but it was a, a, a good experience, also a tough experience, mm -hmm. right. because um, the Dutch is, uh, the Netherlands is a very small country, so you actually have an opportunity to get all the players together on a Sunday morning and spend three to four hours practicing. Um, and, and if you can imagine, as a teenager, I had to travel to Rotterdam mostly, which is um, about an hour by public transport, um, starting at 9 a.m., uh, practicing until 1 p.m., uh, did mean that Saturday evenings were not the typical teenager evening for me. Mm -hmm. uh, no late nights out in bars and getting drunk or whatever you might want to do. So um, that that was tough. And I think that was partly also a reason that at some point um, I, I didn't care that uh, that much that I lost that position. I mm -hmm. was never one. I mean, I was... Um, sort of always number 10, 11, 12 in the team, so, so not uh, the top player. Um, and yes, at some point, I think life became more important than, than just sports. And, and I switched to doing a bit more kind of relaxed basketball. I continued to play basketball for a long time. Uh, also played a bit of volleyball. Um, so sport has always been important to me. Soccer, basketball, um, volleyball. Mm -hmm. Interesting, I think, always team sports. I mm. did enjoy team sports more than individuals. Yeah, but it's still very impressive because uh, may, you made to the national team. Uh, and it's, I know it's a small country, but uh, it's, it's already a very impressive achievement. Um, and which type of music did you like to listen back in the day? So I had uh, varying tastes, um, uh, I, all the way from uh, Deep Purple, Pink Floyd, up to Earth, Wind and Fire. So, um, of course, I grew up in the time that Saturday Night Fever was one of the hit movies um, and disco was uh, in. So uh, I, I could enjoy lots of different types of music. Do you remember when The Dark Side of the Moon came out in the 70s? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Uh, and yes, that was uh, quite uh, quite an album. Absolutely, yeah. I'm a big fan of that uh, album. Um, and do you know how to play any musical instrument? Yes, I played uh, for quite a while growing up. My parents... Uh, thought it important that I learned something about music. Um, music was not a big thing in schools. Um, so you had to do that sort of outside school and they signed me up for a music school when I was eight, um, which spent a lot of time on obviously learning how to read music, but also going over the lives of the famous composers um, started learning music by playing recorder that uh, is easy for uh, everyone mm -hmm. to do and then i switched to clarinet um, even though i really wanted to play saxophone uh, but this was more a classical education so they uh, encouraged me to actually learn clarinet which has a slightly larger range and there is more classical music available so i've done that for a number of years um, and i'm still happy that i did it uh, but i guess sort of in my late teenage years i sort of let that go a little bit right um did you like to read books uh, in those days 
Yes, I remember, I mean, I read books uh, very early on, even in elementary school, as soon as I started learning. I have very fond memories of uh, going on Wednesday evenings, uh, early evenings with my mom to the library to change books. Um, and also sort of coming home uh, at lunchtime and um, my mother and I would both be reading a book rather than uh, I mean, discussing what happened in school. Um, and yes, yeah, so I read um, many different uh, sort of popular authors like uh, Ken Follett, uh, but also the really classical authors like Dostoevsky, uh, Tolstoy, um, in school, we had to um, read uh, Shakespeare and, and all the others. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yes, but I still like reading. I read a lot. Excellent. Uh, the Netherlands produced many famous artists like Rembrandt, Van Gogh, and so on. Uh, are you fond of arts in general? In addition to music, of course. Yes. Um, yes, I'm fond of art, especially indeed uh, paintings, uh, less so sculptures. Um, and yes, clearly both Van Gogh and Rembrandt are uh, among my favorites. Uh, whenever I visit the Netherlands now, I will go to the Van Gogh Museum, which is just fantastic. And it's a great experience. Yes, yes. Um, Rembrandt is, is different, but also, I mean, the way he can sort of represent and, and work with light is just phenomenal. Yeah. So, yes, I, I'm a big fan and I have lots of books about both of them. Yeah, I even went to Rembrandt's house uh, this time mm -hmm. uh, and it's fantastic. Uh, so, um, did you do well in school? Yes, I was. Uh, I, I've always been a good student. I mean, learning came easy to me. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you were close to finish high school, uh, you got a special gift from your aunt. Tell me more about it. Yes, so my aunt uh, in that time uh, visited Hong Kong regularly and electronics were a lot cheaper in Hong Kong at the time than they were in the Netherlands. And sort of at, at the end of high school, uh, as, as a gift, she came back with a, a Texas Instrument uh, 58 programmable calculator. So it was among the first uh, handheld devices that you could actually program. and. Uh, I did get really into that. Mm -hmm. You really made good use of that calculator, uh, even in your summer job, correct? That's right. As I mentioned earlier, my dad worked at a bank and um, I had for a few years um, summer jobs at the bank. Uh, one year, I think the first time, all I did was spend time in the safe, uh, counting uh, documents and, 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 and money, etc. But um, one year, probably my first year in, 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 in while I was at university, um, I, I was asked by some people, some person sort of doing wealth management um, because my dad told him that I was studying mathematics and like computing um, to answer a question um, which turned out uh, at the time I couldn't state that as succinctly as now that it meant solving a system of equations. Um, I think there were five with five variables. Um, and, and I think I kind of invented Gaussian elimination sort of by myself at the <laughs> time and managed to solve this set of equations. And he was so happy about it because that he said, look, I, I have to do this regularly. It, is it possible for you to program this on your calculator? And so I ended uh, with probably a very crude 
uh, algorithm implemented on a Texas instrument. Uh, it, it was nice because they had magnetic strips that you could actually record your program and reuse it. So that was really my first encounter with useful computing. That's remarkable. Uh, you have a master's degree in mathematical computing. Could you talk more about this degree? And, and would, would you like to take this opportunity to explain about the system adopted by the university regarding the bachelor and master's degree? Sure. So um, the situation now, I think, is a bit different than, than when I studied. Uh, but at the time in the Netherlands, uh, basically, the only degree that was available was a master's degree. Um, there was a first phase, Propaduise, which is the first year and a half in which they do test you to see if they think you're going to make it all the way to the end. Uh, but it's not like an undergraduate degree. It comes a bit earlier. Um, I decided to study mathematics, even though I wanted to do computer science, but computer science wasn't an official uh, degree program offered in 1978 when I started. Um, so I studied math and in 1979 they did offer a computer science degree, but I decided to continue with my math degree and just taking as electives a lot of compute, computing classes. And so to reflect that my official uh, master's degree, it's in mathematics with a specialization mathematical computing. Mm. Right. Uh... When and how uh, did you first learn about OR? So it, during my studies of mathematics, there were uh, courses in operations research as well as graph theory, which is, is in a way close, uh, algorithms on networks and graphs. Uh, so both of them intrigued me a lot, especially the OR courses, because it brought together the three elements that I care most about. Um, ac actual real applications. I mean, think about sort of Google Maps and shortest paths. They're real applications. Um, algorithms, uh, it's sort of the logic of algorithms, as well as computing and data. So to me, bringing all this together was phenomenal. And, and uh, it, it, in a way, really clearly set the, the path for the future. Mm -hmm. um... What was your first research project? So there were actually two. Um, so as part of the master's degree, you had to write uh, a, a master's thesis, uh, which I did on um, computational complexity theory. Um, so there are the famous results by CARP mm -hmm. uh, that proved that six problems were NP-complete, starting from satisfiability. Um, I actually proved that the same six problems were NP-complete, started from a different problem, bounded tiling, that you can also show uh, relatively easily is an NP-complete problem from scratch. Um, so that was one uh, research project I did, uh, which resulted in a conference paper. Um, but really my first publication came from um, work I did as a student assistant, uh, or in, in sort of modern terms, undergraduate uh, assistant, which I did in the econometrics faculty of the University of Amsterdam, where I studied, uh, because that was where the OR faculty were. So uh, Lex Schreiber, for example, was there at the time, although I didn't do my research project with him. Uh, I worked on um, degree constrained minimum spanning trees. So you can identify one particular node in the tree and you restrict uh, the degree, uh, and then you want to find the minimum spanning tree given that restriction, um, that problem becomes NP-complete, and, and I implemented a heuristic for that problem, and that uh, resulted in my first publication. Wow. 
so you published your first uh, paper before graduating then? Yes. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, you mentioned uh, the great Alexander Shriver. Uh, when you were a student assistant, you once went looking for him at his office, but you accidentally found another legend uh, there uh, in an unorthodox situation, let's put it like that. <laughs> yes, that's true. So, um, Lex, I, I mean, for those of you who know Lex, he's very friendly and accommodating and always happy to help. And so whenever I had um, a, a question that, that I felt I, I needed some help, I would walk over to his office and, and ask questions. And at this particular day, I walked to his office and the door was open. Um, and, and in the office was a tall person uh, looking more like a lost hippie than anything else. Um, with a young woman in uh, sort of uh, there as well, um, and I was a bit confused. It, it didn't look at all like somebody that Lex would really interact with. Um, and since I saw he wasn't there, I went back to my office. Um, that afternoon, there was a seminar, uh, departmental seminar, and I went to the seminar um, and surprise, surprise, the person giving the seminar was the strange hippie looking person that uh, that that I saw earlier. And um, it turned out that that was Jake Edmonds. <laughs> wow, so, so that was quite uh, a, quite an interesting experience. Long and hair, he, he, cowboy long head, hair, cowboy head <laughs> and all of that. And uh, yes, I, I, I met Jack uh, once or twice after that, and of course he always uh, <laughs> uh, looked a bit, let's say, eccentric. Wow, it should have been a very interesting experience. Uh, I wish I could have seen your face when you, you witnessed that. <laughs> yes, yes, when I walked into the office, and, and Lex is always, uh, I mean, casually but impeccably dressed, mm -hmm. and so it was a big contrast to see Jack Edmonds and, and Lex. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, why did you decide to do a PhD and who was your PhD advisor? So my PhD advisor was young Carl Lindstra, who was um, sort of made a lot of contributions, especially in machine scheduling. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, has written a lot of papers with uh, 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 Alexander Renoy Khan. Uh, they were a pair in a way, uh, working really hard. Um, in the Netherlands at the time, PhD research projects had to come about and, and Jan-Karl Lindstra had a, a project around vehicle routing um, and was looking for a candidate. And since I was a student assistant and doing OR, I was asked if I would be interested. And I said, yes, I went to talk with young Carl and he seemed to be happy with me. And so I sort of rolled into that project in that way, uh, which was at, um, Center for Mathematics and Computer Science, Computing Science. So it was not at the university, but in one of the uh, sort of, I would say, famous research institutes in the Netherlands dedicated to mathematics and, and computing. Okay. Uh, and during your PhD, you shared the lab with a very famous person, right? That That is true. At the time, he was not yet famous, <laughs> but he is now. Um, it, it was quite interesting. So there was a small computer lab at the top floor. Uh, I went there primarily because it had one of the few terminals that allowed you to do graphics. And part of my research uh, involved developing a graphical user interface to a vehicle routing package. Um, and the person sitting next to me very often, I, we didn't interact very much, but I knew about him because he was well known in the, in, in, in sort of the center as a bit of a nerdy person, uh, mainly in terms of programming and software engineering. Uh, and his name was Guido van Rossum. 
And for those of you that uh, know Python, the programming language, uh, he's the one that uh, sort of created the Python language and is still involved in a way as the father of Python uh, in the organization. And of course, his impact on the world has been much bigger than mine. So he was actually creating Python back then, or that happened? Uh, no, that, that happened later. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he was at the time uh, creating a programming language called B, mm -hmm. uh, and, and also dedicated editors that are aware of the programming language. So he was always involved in development of languages. And so Python, for example, the, the indentations, et cetera, have meaning. Some of these concepts uh, he was already working on mm -hmm. at the time, but not specifically Python. That came later. Right. Very, very interesting to know about that. A bit unexpected, I must say. But yeah, nice. Uh, you were also an assistant professor uh, at Erasmus University, uh, and you used to share the office with yet another important person. <laughs> yes, that's right. So um, towards the end of my PhD, I was asked if I wanted to be in a way assistant professor for one day a week to help out with some teaching uh, at Erasmus University. Um, and at that time, Alexander Renoy Khan uh, was the youngest uh, Chancellor or Rector Magnificus in the Netherlands uh, at, at the Dutch University. I think he was, he became that uh, at age of 30, which is really young. Um, and therefore had an office in the administration building, uh, as well as an office in the department. And since I was only there one day a week, they let me use uh, the departmental office, which so I didn't see him very often during those days, but sometimes we were there together. Uh -huh. Yeah. He became a politician later, right? In his life? Uh, later, he became a uh, a kind of politician. He mm -hmm. represented uh, sort of work, I mean, employers uh, and businesses. Uh, I, I forget the name of the organization, but he dealt, uh, he dealt a lot in politics and met with all the politicians. Mm -hmm. There were rumors that he, we, he would become a minister of education, but I don't think that in the end ever materialized. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about the weekly meetings to study a famous combinatorial optimization book? Yes, one thing that is nice about the Netherlands, because it's so small, everybody interested in OR can in a way come together uh, in Utrecht, which is pretty much the center of the country. And so when the the, the combinatorial optimization book by Papadimitriou and Steiglitz uh, came out, um, a, a group decided that we would work through the book, mostly PhD students, but a few faculty members um, would come together. Um, each, each week we would look at the chapter, somebody would prepare. And, and the one thing that I remember quite clearly is that we would also try on that day to do some of the exercises that were uh, presented in the book. Um, and Lex Schreiber was there and, and it always amazed me sort of how quickly he would come up with counterexamples to some of our ideas or, or help us along the way. Um, he's truly one of the most phenomenal people in our field. Uh, and he has been in many ways a great inspiration for me. Wow. I mean, to, to see him in action at that time. Yes. And, and his famous collection of books, like those three volumes, are just, I mean, amazing. Yes, it's out of this world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> mind-boggling. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, it, it would take me many years just to read them, let alone write them. Yeah. It's, uh, and, and, and so maybe the one thing that not everybody knows, his book theory of, of linear and integer programming, which in itself is a phenomenal book, 
was really meant as sort of basic material that you needed to know before the real book that he was working on, the series on combinatorial optimization. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> and talking about meetings, you once met a legend in our field in Eindhoven, but you only realized later who he was. That is true, yes. Yeah. So um, at, at the time I was still doing my PhD, which focused on uh, developing uh, algorithms for vehicle routing problems. Um, and so there was a small work group that, that came together um, in Eindhoven um, in the evening. Again, it's an hour by train from Amsterdam, so it's not that difficult. And since I was uh, doing a PhD on routing algorithms, a, 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 a work group meeting on routing seemed something I should go to. And so it was a very small meeting with maybe only six people. And one of the people in the room was an elderly gentleman um, that I felt did not make that many useful comments on routing, uh, etc. But I didn't really know who he was. Maybe I, I ended up being late or the meeting was not so well organized that introductions were not done. Um, and so I only found out afterwards that the person, the elderly gentleman that I mentioned earlier, actually was Jacques Benders from Benders Decomposition. <laughs> I mean, you met uh, all of the Dutch legends, uh, and I wonder, did you meet uh, Dijkstra? I did meet Dijkstra as well at the institute where I did my PhD. Uh, there was a workshop uh, one day where uh, Dijkstra was one of the speakers. Um, and and I, I also found at that time that he actually is not necessarily such a nice person. Oh. Um, he could be quite uh, obnoxious uh, when he was in the audience if he didn't really like what the person speaking was talking about. He would tap his fingers on the table sort of to show his displeasure. And I've heard from others that know Dijkstra a lot better that this is not the only time that something like that occurred. So he, I mean, obviously he did something quite important for our field and it's nice that it was done by a Dutch person, but as a person, uh, he wasn't a very nice uh, individual. Okay, so he's not as inspiring as uh, Alexander Shriver and the other guys from the Netherlands. In, in terms of the combination of just personality and contribution, definitely he is not in the league of Lex Shriver. Right. And how was your first international conference overseas? So my first international conference was math programming in Boston in 1985. Um, and it was also my first ever trip to the US. So it was uh, quite impressive for me. It was not the first time I had been in an airplane, but it, uh, the first time to the US. Um, in those days, um, when I was doing my PhD, um, the internet was not where it is now, and, and you had to actually go to libraries to get papers, and um, journal articles did not were not in the habit of printing pictures with authors. So um, I, I had read a lot of papers, and uh, this was an opportunity for the first time to put faces to some of the names that I ended up with. And, and there are two things that I especially remember, well, maybe three about that conference. The first was that this was in the time that Karmar Carr had uh, published his paper a year or so earlier about the first polynomial time algorithm for linear programming. Uh, and so he was one of the plenary speakers. And, and I remember that presentation very well. I had read the paper again with a group of people in the Netherlands. We had studied the paper in detail. Um, and when it came to presenting some of the computational results, um, 
it actually became quite a heated discussion because people at IBM, specifically John Tomlin, um, had been trying to replicate some of the computational uh, results that Karma Car was presenting and hadn't been able to. And so as a young PhD student, um, having Tomlin standing in, in, in uh, standing up and shouting that he didn't believe him and that they had tried very hard based on the information provided to replicate these results and were unable to uh, was quite an experience. Uh, I mean, in, in general, our field is quite relaxed and friendly. Uh, in this particular instance, probably because there were also commercial interests, right? Karma Car at the time was at AT&T, and of course IBM was the other big player in optimization. Um, so yes, it was an interesting experience. The, the other experience was that Kantorovich was there. Uh, so my first time ever seeing a Nobel Prize winner um, and he was already old, but he was giving a presentation at the conference, uh, which I attended. Uh, but the presentation was in Russian, uh, which led to quite an interesting experience because it needed a translator. And um, the translator, I don't know if on purpose he was trying to be funny or this was just a way of doing things, but it, the translation went roughly like, there seems to be something like a linear program, uh, and you probably know better than I do. And then there is also this other object that he refers to as a dual linear program. Uh, and, and so on and on and on. Uh, so the, the, the talk itself, I don't remember much about, but seeing Kantorovich and, and um, having a talk being translated was quite uh, an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. Also in that conference, a very famous name asked you a question uh, after your presentation. Yes, that's, that's true. That's probably the other thing I remember most about uh, the conference. I presented uh, some of my work that I had done for my PhD had to do with um, local search for um, traveling salesman problems with time windows, which was one of the first topics I worked on on my PhD. And I gave a presentation of that and afterwards um, a person with a very very big moustache walked up to me uh, to ask questions um, and at the time i didn't know who it was but uh, of course later we actually became uh, good friends it was bruce golden <laughs> Um, who, of course, in, in the routing community is very well known, has made some fundamental contributions and, and is still active. Yeah, so he was already using that mustache uh, in the mid 80s. <laughs> yes, yes. Nice. Uh, and what was your PhD research about? So as I mentioned, my PhD research was about vehicle routing algorithms. I think at the time um, it, it moved from being just simply an extension of uh, the TSP to something that had uh, more potential for real life application, specifically because in that time, uh, time windows were introduced, uh, Marius Solomon, uh, the Solomon instances we all know very well and are now misused for almost anything you want, <laughs> uh, introduced uh, the first work on uh, vehicle routing problems with time windows. And that's something that um, I started working on also on introducing pickup and deliveries rather than just deliveries, uh, precedence constraints, etc. Um, because ultimately the goal of my PhD research was actually to develop a software package that could be used in practice. 
And so I did develop a software package that was used in practice for a little while, at least in the Benelux, the, the area of the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg. Um, but it also meant that I spent a lot of time working on graphical user interfaces, which is, I mentioned earlier, where I met Guido van Rossum. Um, and this was all quite complicated, uh, given that it all had to happen on PCs with uh, very, very, very limited memory. So implementations were, I mean, caching and overlays. It, it was quite, uh, quite a big thing. And Windows didn't yet exist at that time. You went to Georgia Tech in the late 80s after finishing your PhD, but not yet as a faculty, correct? That's true. After I completed my PhD, um, I was encouraged by my advisor to see if I could spend some time abroad, if I wanted a long-term career in academia. And so I applied for a Fulbright scholarship as well as for a, a Dutch government uh, grant to, to spend time abroad. And um, I ended up going to Georgia Tech. At the time, I really was interested in sort of polyhedral combinatorics um, and integer programming methodology and the opportunity to work with especially George Nemhauser, but also Ellis Johnson at Georgia Tech seemed something that I shouldn't pass up. And they were happy for me to come and, and spend a year there. Wow, you were lucky enough to, to work with such a great uh, pantheon of uh, OR stars uh, in your early career. And that's, that's uh, something that definitely had an impact later in, in your uh, life. Yes, I, I, I do think that uh, in, in many ways I have been very lucky. Uh, my advisor at the time was very well known in the community. He was editor of some of the journals. He was president of the Math Programming Society. So he had all the connections. And that certainly facilitated uh, sort of opportunities for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then later, of course, uh, being the most prolific collaborator with George Nemhauser, I think we've written more than 30 papers together. Um, is is because he's also a legend in the field, Absolutely. rightfully so, uh, helped me a lot. Yeah. What did you learn from George Nemhauser and Alice Johnson? So that's an interesting question and, and good to think a little bit about. I think in a way, what is most important for any successful researcher is first and foremost asking the right questions. Um, and, and some of that comes with experience and some of that comes with taste. Uh, but one of the things I found, and, and that was always quite helpful in, in meetings with uh, George especially, uh, is that there were always the right questions asked in terms of being able to progress what we were doing. Um, and then, of course, his broad knowledge and, and deep understanding of issues, uh, what, I mean, helped a lot. But, but I think asking the right questions, um, in general, in research, recognizing opportunities um, is quite important. And, and I think the most successful researchers have that ability to recognize that, uh, hey, this is, this is the right thing to work on at the time. Uh, for example, shortly after I joined Georgia Tech as a faculty member a few years later, we invested heavily in column generation for integer programming, and it was just the right time to do it, right? And there are other times when Bertimus, for example, introduced robust optimization. It, w it was just the right time to start thinking about these questions. And, mm -hmm. and I think this is a, a trademark of the really successful people that they are able to 
sort of recognize the opportunities and jump on them. Yeah, so they're not only brilliant, technically speaking, but they also they have the right. knack and the vision to yes. uh, identify the opportunities to, to make right. relevant contribution and therefore have yeah. some impact, right? Uh, and what about Alice Johnson? Um, Alice Johnson, it's, it's hard to describe. I mean, I think, I mean, he's brilliant, but he, he doesn't necessarily always communicate uh, very well. And I think the problem is that his mind is so much faster than his ability to speak that that creates some issue sometimes. On the other hand, uh, the thing I learned, which is a, a very positive characteristic, um, he would never mind if you would say, look, somehow I, I, I couldn't fully grasp what you were conveying. Could you go over this again? Right. So he didn't mind that at all. But I think um, you had to learn to communicate with with Ellis. If you want to hear a, a, an interesting anecdote about uh, Ellis, then then I, I have one for you. Please. Um, so this was at an informs conference. Um, where Ellis was giving a 20 minute presentation and he spent the first 15 minutes of the presentation on his first slide. And all the audience was just waiting for him to move on to the second slide. And finally, after 15 minutes, he puts up the second slide. This was not PowerPoint, right? This was real slides, <laughs> physical slides. And he points at the first line on the second slide and then he says, oh, no, 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 no. Let me go back and uh, say, and, and so he went back to the first slide and the whole audience like, oh. <laughs> So it, it was quite an interesting experience. He, so he, mm -hmm. he, he's really smart. He's not the best presenter, uh, but it is a pleasure to work with him because he is truly brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can only uh, picture the situation. He built the momentum and then let me go back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, yeah. That's, that's very uh, amusing. I mean, it's a very, it's a, it's an amusing uh, anecdote. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. so your first permanent job was at TUE in Eindhoven, right? Correct. I, again, um, young Carl Lindstra, uh, so he moved to become from the, the research institute. He moved to Eindhoven to become full professor there. Um, and he asked me if I was willing to join him there uh, upon my return from uh, my year abroad at Georgia Tech, which I was happy to do. Um, so I joined Eindhoven. Uh, young Carl was nice enough to immediately make me associate professor, which was also, uh, of course, nice. And so, yes, that was my first uh, official academic position. Yeah, after graduating with the PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, I was uh, a visiting professor at TUE in October, uh, hosted by uh, Tom van Unsel. And when I was there, I especially asked him to contact you. So if you could uh, uh, be a guest uh, in the podcast. So uh, this is a some connection with Eindhoven and in such a great campus, right. great university. And it, it is nice. Yes, <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. I was there only for a very short period, but I did enjoy it there. Um, and, and of course, it, I also had my first PhD student, of course, uh, there, mm -hmm. um, which was quite nice. We worked on polyhedral methods for scheduling problems um and she did well and she's uh, still a professor at utrecht university at the moment nice uh, and what made you move to the us uh for real and join georgia tech now as a faculty member so math programming conference was in amsterdam in 1991 
And at that time there, I was approached by Bill Pulleyblank, another person that has contributed quite a lot in uh, in combinatorial optimization and integer programming, and who at that time was heading the mathematical research division uh, of IBM in Yorktown Heights, one of their premier research labs. And he asked me if I was interested in joining them. And that was not an easy decision to make, even though it was appealing. Uh, I had a family with young children at the time, and, and so it was not the decision that was completely up to me. And I explained that to Bill, and he said, well, why don't you and your family just come for a few months and see if you, if you like it there? Uh, which we did, which was a great experience. But we also felt that from a family perspective, it was not necessarily the place that we wanted to be. Um, it, it sounds like you're close to New York and that's appealing, but uh, to get there and to park and, and so you're really a bit more in the country. And that was not the life that we were looking for at that time. Um, but George Nemhauser heard about the fact that I was actually contemplating possibly moving to the US. And then he contacted me and said, well, why don't you come to Georgia Tech instead? Um, and since we had a great time the year in Atlanta, that's what we decided to do. OK, uh, because this is a question that uh, a lot of people might wonder. Uh, why did you leave the Netherlands? Uh, and of course, Georgia Tech is an excellent, fantastic, uh, one of the top universities in the world. But still, right there, there there's it, it also has a much better climate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, that sounds that sounds maybe a bit silly, but I do think it it had an impact on our decision. So one really that Georgia Tech uh, for the kind of things that I wanted and have done is probably, I mean, one of the top three places that you can think of. Uh, and uh, the Netherlands, the climate is, is not so nice. Uh, it, it's changing, it seems, but certainly it rains a lot and it's, it, it's never really cold. It's never really hot. It's, uh, and Atlanta has, I mean, not everybody would agree, but I think a very pleasant climate. So that certainly helped ease the decision, <laughs> but it was primarily because it's just a great place. It's the largest I, uh, industrial engineering department in the world. And being able to interact with uh, sort of 60 other faculty members, if, if you want to, is just phenomenal. All right. Very convincing. <laughs> uh, I know that you have many important contributions in the field of combinatorial optimization. Uh, which ones do you consider the most impactful? Um, so it, it's, it's interesting. So my career, when it comes to research, has focused on the one hand on, let's say, integer programming methodology, and on the other hand on transportation. Um, and, and I think there are sort of different contributions that I'm proud of in, in the different areas. Um, probably the greatest impact has come from the integer programming side, partly because Zong Hao Gu was one of my PhD students, uh, jointly advised with George. And of course, he wrote the integer programming engine for Cplex to start with. And then he became part of Gurobi, right? The name Gu in Gurobi is from, from him. Um, and so as a PhD student, he worked with me on um, sort of enhancements to the integer programming software package, Minto, that I had started a few years before that. Uh, so that was, uh, in a way, a very important contribution, training Gu. 
Uh, <laughs> the other is the work that we did early on on branch and price, um, sort of column generation to solve huge integer programs, which has had uh, a big impact. Uh, branch and price, now branch and price and cut and all the variants is still a very popular um, uh, Method, methodology that people use, and, and we were at the forefront of, of developing that. You actually coined the term fresh and price. That's right, yes. So, of course, branch and cut uh, was very popular at the time. All the work on the TSP, uh, Grutchell, Pat Burke. Uh, and so when we started to work on column generation for solving integer programs, it seems like um, I mean, the critical thing there was the sort of de departing from the early work by Gomery, etc., on cutting stock was to really also price uh, when you get into the, the branch and bound tree. And so in analogy to branch and cut, I thought branch and price sort of would, would be a nice term to use. And do you prefer branch cut and price or branch price and cut? Um, well, I think they should, it depends. I mean, you can assign different meanings to them if you want, but uh, I'm fine with either one, uh, whatever people prefer. Okay. Uh, one of your contributions that I enjoyed the most is how you found a way together with a collaborator to perform move evaluations in constant time in local search algorithms for the uh, VRP with time windows. How did you have this idea? So when I was doing my PhD research, I, I shared an office with Gerard Kindervater, um, who was also doing a PhD at the time, but his topic uh, was parallel computing and my topic was vehicle routing. But if you share an office, of course, you, you talk a lot and you hear a lot about um, what, what the others are doing. And, and in parallel computing, um, certainly at the time, sort of what you can keep in memory and whether it's shared memory, whether it's local memory. And, and so he spent a lot of time thinking about what information to store to facilitate uh, efficient computation. And I think that prompted me to start looking at local search algorithms to see if storing information uh, for future use even in a sort of algorithm that's not parallelized, could be helpful. And it turned out that in combination with an appropriate search strategy, um, you can keep information about stop paths in, in a solution and then use that to do the checking in constant time, which was one of the indeed first contributions uh, of my thesis. And one that um, turned out to be quite helpful and has been refined and improved over time by, by several people and generalized. Yeah, by Thibaut Vidal, for example. He, for example. Yeah, he yep. took the notion of subsequences and formalized and generalized the idea and um, with the concept of uh, time warp and things like that. So, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you were one of the few authors I know from the US that worked on canonical variants of vehicle routing problems. Uh, do you know why the interest in working in this class of problems in the US is not so high as in other places like Europe, Canada, Brazil, and so on? Um, I think when you say canonical VRP problems, I, I assume implicitly you are also referring to exact algorithms for these kind of problems. Yeah, both. Uh, it can be both uh, heuristic. Both. Yeah, and exact. But I mean, for the standard vari variants like VRP TW, heterogeneous fleet VRP, and so on. Um, so I, I, can, I can give at least some intuition on why this happens, uh, at least on the exact side. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think part of it is the US system where there is a lot of pressure in sort of getting tenure and uh, I mean, promotion 
on writing papers and producing lots of papers if possible. Uh, of course, high quality would even be better, but, and, and so one of the issues in that system is that to get into an area like exact algorithms for vehicle routing problems, you have to invest quite a bit of time because the, the, the it's already quite advanced in terms of what's out there. So if you want to make new contributions, you have to invest really a lot of time in building the right infrastructure, learning a lot of things. And, and the environment in the US is really not conducive to do that. Um, and so the, the groups in Montreal, in Brazil, in... in, in Bologna. In, uh, Bologna or also in Denmark, mm -hmm. where they did invest a lot of time in sort of slowly building up that technology, it becomes easier to continue that research. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the, the pressure to really publish if you want to get tenure, um, it doesn't always provide the right incentives to do, I mean, maybe the work that you truly want to do or, yeah. Mm -hmm. maybe I think that's at least a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do think, by the way, it's quite important for our field to not ignore true applications. And uh, I mean, our field started really as helping, well, during the war, uh, solving real problems. And so one thing I do not really like in terms of research is coming up with the hundredth small variation of a VRP and then showing that you can come up with a taboo search algorithm for it. Um, and the variation is not even motivated by some real industrial setting. Um, so I, I do admire people that can do real impactful research, uh, OR research, uh, because, and I think we don't necessarily see enough of it in the community. Right. Uh, you acted as editor-in-chief of Transportation Science, um, a highly prestigious journal uh, in our field. Overall, uh, how was the experience? It, it was overall a good experience. Uh, in part, I felt it was very important to give something back to the community. The transportation science and logistics community has been quite important uh, for me as a researcher. Uh, plus, it, it's, uh, it, it has some phenomenally nice and, and good people. Um, so when I was asked to become editor, if I was interested, I agreed, knowing that it would be uh, quite a time-consuming uh, job, which turned out to be true. Um, it went from about 200 submissions per year when I started to um, close to, well, over 400, uh, closer to 500 submissions per year uh, when I finished six years later. Um, and if you realize that um, I read all the submissions before deciding uh, what to do, either to desk reject or to assign to an associate editor, um, plus dealing with complaints, which is the most time consuming, um, it, it does mean that you have to dedicate quite a bit of time. I think overall, I would probably dedicate 45 minutes to an hour per day on the journal. Including uh, the vacation period? Including vacation periods. Wow. Yes, because if, if you go off for two weeks, the accumulation is just too big and it's hard to get back. So I typically also in vacations, at least every other day, um, would work on the journal. And how did you handle complaints? Complaints is probably the most difficult aspect. Um, 
In part because the people that complain tend to be the people that are also at least sort of well-established, let's put it that way, in the community, right? If you're a, a starting uh, assistant professor, you don't necessarily immediately complain if you get a, a rejection from a journal. Um, but if you're a well-established researcher and you feel that the decision is, is not the right one, um, you are more inclined to, to, to complain or at least ask about this. And that's difficult because uh, that means that I probably know the people personally quite well. Uh, and you, of course, don't want to make decisions influenced too much by your personal relationship and you want to remain objective. Um, and that's difficult. Uh, I still had to come back that after reviewing and discussing with associate editors, going through the paper myself, going through the reports in detail, that you find that the decision of reject was the right one. And often it's subjective, right? I mean, right. especially for a journal like Transportation Science, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's technically something wrong with the paper but that the contribution uh, may not be strong enough. And, and that kind of argument is, is, is very difficult. When is a contribution strong enough and when is it not strong enough? So, so those, those situations uh, were difficult and time consuming. The only thing I can say is that um, even if I came back and say the decision, original decision was warranted, it was usually also accepted and it didn't lead to sort of fallouts with colleagues that, uh, so I think in that sense, again, I really like our community. Uh, they accept that sometimes decisions go one way and sometimes they go a different way. And as long as they feel that proper attention was given to their arguments, they would be okay with it. Mm -hmm. So in general, the experience was really positive. It, it was a positive experience. I mean, the other thing is you get to interact and, and not only interact, but, but in a way can help some people in their career by sort of uh, adding them as associate editor to uh, sort of the editorial team is something that for some people can be quite helpful. And of course, again, you don't do it uh, just because you like a person, they need to qualify to sort of be in that position. Um, but it's nice, you interact with uh, a lot of people in the field in, in a different way. Um, you see a lot of uh, work that is done in the community. Um, you, you also have quite a bit of influence in terms of, let's say, special issues and, and picking topics that you think are important. Uh, so yes, it's been, it's been rewarding as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time consuming, but uh, rewarding. That's, that's yes. uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, at some point you moved to Australia. Why? Yes, that's, um, I mean, it was a very personal decision uh, made in a difficult time in my life. Um, my first wife passed away after a battle with cancer relatively young, uh, 49. Um, and that meant that um, there was a period of reflection on my part about life. Uh, and, and what to expect of life and, and what I wanted to do. And um, one thing I wanted to do is take in a way a little bit of time off or at least be in a different environment. Um, so I decided to go on a sabbatical or at least something similar because Georgia Tech doesn't officially have sabbaticals. Um, and I didn't really know where to go, but I wanted to go to a place where I could speak the language. I was going to be by myself. So uh, I didn't want to go to the Netherlands. I didn't want to go to England because I don't like the climate well enough. South Africa, I thought about briefly. 
Um, but Australia was certainly satisfying those requirements. Um, and one of my PhD students that was originally from New Zealand had just joined a new OR group uh, in Australia um, that was led by a person that had spent a postdoc year at Georgia Tech, so I knew her as well. <clears throat> So I contacted her if it was okay for me to uh, come and do a sabbatical uh, in Australia for six months uh, in the group that she was building. And I did that and it turned out that there was more there than just research. We ended up liking each other um, maybe more than expected and ended up uh, becoming a couple. Wow. And, and that ultimately prompted, uh, after I went back to the US and sort of managing a relation a, across that distance is too complicated. Uh, and so ultimately I decided that maybe this should be a more permanent move. And so I moved to Australia in 2010. Okay, you briefly moved back to Atlanta for some... Uh, also, pers also personal reasons. Um, my youngest son was going through a very difficult period in his life. And I felt that it would be better for him if I could be closer. Um, so we went back to the US for little over five years. Mm. And now you're back in Australia. Uh, and now we are back in Australia. I, we both retired from Georgia Tech and moved to Australia. Yeah, so after retirement, uh, how are you making yourself busy these days? So it is interesting. We tried very hard to just enjoy life, uh, spent a lot of time on the beach, spent a lot of time in the bush, go cycling, go hiking, um, which we enjoy a lot. And I still get a lot of pleasure out of it, but, but you do miss kind of the intellectual challenges and stimulation. We try to keep that up a little bit <clears throat> But in the end, uh, when an opportunity came for me to become an Amazon scholar, uh, which means a one day a week engagement as an advisor um, to research teams uh, at, at Amazon, um, I decided to jump on that. That was exactly right for me. It's a limited amount of time. You get the intellectual stimulation. And I have a lot of time left for other sort of more fun activities as well. Mm -hmm. So that has been a fantastic uh, opportunity for me. And I've been doing that now for about five months. And, and I really like it. Excellent. Uh, so Martin, looking back at your long career, uh, is there anything that you wish you would have done differently? No, I can't say so. I think that uh, all the decisions I made certainly at the times were the right decisions. Um, and, and in many ways, they all have worked out well for me too. Um, and I really look back at, at sort of my career in a very happy way. I, I really enjoyed everything I've done. And so, no, I have no regrets. All right. So, Martin, it was fantastic to talk to you. Uh, I mean, it was a treat to, to get to listen to your stories and anecdotes. And uh, I mean, thank you so much. I enjoyed it very much, too. And uh, um, yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing if, if there's going to be reactions from people that get to see the podcast. Ah, for sure they will. So Martin, uh, in case, I know you like to travel, so in case you, you were interested in visiting Brazil, uh, just <laughs> drop me a line and we can arrange something uh, eventually. I'll keep that in mind. Okay, so nice talking to you and see you soon, hopefully. Bye, ciao. Bye. Bye.